start, this is an issue that is really um, new to the committee, and we have people around the side who rarely are in this committee, so I'd like the committee members to introduce themselves, and then I'd like the people who are following this um, um, to introduce themselves and what their interest is. This will help us to know who to receive testimony from and who all is interested. But, um, Kelly Payala, representing London Dairy West and Wind Hall, Dan Noyes from Wolcott High Park, Johnson Hall. Uh, Teresa Wood from Waterbury, also serving in Bolton, Huntington, and Fields Fork. Topper McFawn, representing Barrytown. Ann Pugh, South Burlington. Sandy Haas from Rochester, also representing Bethel, Stockbridge, and Pittsfield. And the best streets in South Burlington. Mm -hmm. Carl Rosenquist, representing the town of Georgia. Mary Beth Redmond, Essex. Oh. Logan Nicole, Ludlow, Mount Holly, and Shrewsbury. And I'm Lauren Hurl, the director of Vermont Conservation Voters. <coughs> Hi, I'm Samantha Hurd, the environmental associate for Associated Industry uh, Bill and everyone, um, there's a lot of noise, so we need to use loud voices. Thank you, Madam Chair. Bill Dressel, Associated Industries of Vermont. Chris Kerrigan, VP of Business Development and uh, also the manager of our manufacturing division with the statewide Vermont Chamber of Commerce. Okay. Yeah, this is exciting. Uh, Lisa Fantelli, I'm listening in for the Agency of Agriculture. Okay. Sophie Earhart, legislative intern for BCB, BNRC, and BPA. Jerry Morris, contract lobbyist representing the American Chemistry Council. Worth Allen with Downs Rackham Martin representing the American Cancer Society. Hi, I'm Kimberly Johnson. I'm here with the Necrassen Group. Austin Davis, Lake Champlain Regional Chamber of Commerce. Okay, we're not even sitting together. Um, <clears throat> Julie Tucker is our um, uh, legislative staffs this committee so um, if you have an interest in testifying if you're sitting here I presume you have a position on the bill so I'm going to ask you to make those positions or your, your the pros and cons and how you view this legislation so if you can give um, Julie your contact information that will be helpful and now we'll know what what this is that has gotten a whole new set of people in House Human Services. So this is Mike O'Grady with Legislative Council. Before I start walking through the bill, I want to give you some context for um, where the bill originated and its previous iterations. So in 2016, in Act 154, you, the General Assembly, established a working group <coughs> on chemical use. And you directed that group to make recommendations back to you regarding how to present, prevent citizens from exposure to toxic substances, how the state should identify and regulate toxic um, chemicals that are currently unregulated, and how the state should better inform citizens and communities of potential <coughs> exposure to toxic substances. That working group met and um, it supplied 13 majority policy recommendations. I can provide you a copy of that report if you would like. Um, some of those recommendations have been passed already. Three of those recommendations were included in a bill last biennium called S-103. And what S-103 included was an interagency committee on chemical management a requirement that groundwater you to be used for private wells be tested prior to um, receiving the permit for use, and that uh, there be certain changes to the chemicals of high concern to children program. When that bill originally passed the Senate, your body, the House, didn't have time to address it in the first year of the biennium. Between the first year of the biennium and the second year of the biennium, the governor, by an executive order, established his own interagency committee on chemical management, which looked remarkably similar to what was in S-103 as passed the Senate. When the House took up S-103, um, it passed the interagency committee 
it included the requirements for testing of groundwater and it included the requirements for um, changes to the chemicals of high concern to children program. It was ultimately reconciled between the two bodies and passed. The governor subsequently vetoed it. Um, I can provide you with the veto message. Um, I can send Julie a, a copy later on today. The testing of groundwater was included in another bill, Act 161, and what was left was the creation of the Interagency Committee on Chemical Management and the changes to the Chemicals of High Concern to Children program. That is what is in front of you with S55. So generally, it establishes an Interagency Committee on Chemical Management and it makes changes to the Chemicals of High Concern to Children program. So stepping through the bill, first section, section one, establishes that interagency committee on chemical management. Now the Senate, working with the administration, made changes to the interagency committee to conform it to the governor's committee that was established by executive order. So the purpose of the committee is to evaluate chemical inventories in the state on an annual basis, identify potential risks to human health and the environment from those inventories, and propose measures or mechanisms to address the identified risks from chemicals inventories in the state. The membership of the committee is, is entirely um, state agency heads, and the Secretary of Agriculture is there because they regulate pesticides. Secretary of Natural Resources is there because they regulate hazardous waste, hazardous materials, and toxic substances. Commissioner of Health is there because they have authority over public health and health advisories. Commissioner of Labor is there because they regulate OSHA. Uh, Commissioner of Public Safety is there because they regulate um, something called EPRA uh, and other public safety requirements. <coughs> Uh, Secretary of Commerce is there because of the effect on the economy, and then the Secretary of Digital Services is there because part of their charge is to come up with a reporting system, and then the Secretary of Transportation is there because of their use of um, certain hazardous materials. There is a di uh, directive to the committee to have a citizen's advisory panel to provide input and expertise to the committee. Um, the citizen advisory panel shall consist of persons available on an as-needed basis to provide expertise. Now again, the Senate went through with the administration and conformed this list to what the governor's executive order committee is. Um, it, they were very similar to begin with. Um, the governor had combined some of the positions um, from S103's first passed by the Senate, um, but in general, it's pretty similar list. So there needs to be somebody with an expertise in to toxicology, expertise in environmental health, expertise in maternal and child health, expertise in industrial hygiene, expertise in human health and the environment, expertise in manufacturing products or processes that are located in Vermont, expertise in retail sales, expertise in sm uh, with a small business, uh, that's subject to record keeping requirements. Someone with uh, an academic institution with expertise in chemical management and an expertise in environmental law, expertise in public policy, and expertise in development and administration of information reporting. Now, this committee is going to monitor actions taken by US EPA under the Toxic Substance and Control Act, the federal law regulating chemical use. They'll annually review chemical inventories in the state in relation to emerging scientific evidence to identify chemicals of high concern not regulated by the state, and they shall develop written procedures, guidance, and other resources necessary to carry out its function. They will have the assistance of all of those state agencies that um, the members of the committee represent, and then they report on December 1st, December 15th, 2020 and biennially thereafter to the governor um, and then a copy of that report is given to you including your committee specifically the report includes a summary of chemical use in the state based on the report of chemical in inventories the summary of identified risk to human health and the environment from reported <coughs> chemical inventories 
summary of any change under federal statute or rule affecting the regulation of chemicals in the state, and recommended legislative or regulatory action to reduce human health um, risks and risk to the environment. Then there's language about meetings, Secretary of Natural Resources and the Chair, Secretary of Natural Resources calls the first meeting on before, before July 1, 2019. Um, and it, the whole section, the whole establishment of the committee does not affect the independent authority of the state agencies um, to regulate chemical use or management under state or federal law. Can you explain what that means? So as I pointed out that, that many of those state agencies have various different authorities over chemical use in the state. And this interagency committee isn't going to usurp or amend that authority under existing state or applicable law. This interagency committee is purely an advisory body that's making <coughs> recommendations to the governor and to you. Any of its recommendations or, or um, other actions does not affect its authority under state or applicable federal law. Um, unless you change that law. So section two, it's a transition. It's the intent of the General Assembly that the, the interagency committee established by the governor by executive order fulfill the duties of the interagency committee established by this bill. You can't tell the, the governor that his committee it shall do it. It's, this is going to be, it's the intent um, that that, he, that committee um, serve a purpose. Um, How is that part and parcel of the discussion? Do you know if that was part and parcel of the discussion held on the other body? Yes, it was. I mean, the, so does the governor have independent constitutional authority to issue an executive order to advise him or her on the management of state government. And even though the Constitution has no express executive order authority, there is implied authority over the, under the Constitution mm -hmm. since the governor has this explicit authority to administer and execute the laws. And so if the governor wants advice on how to administer and execute the laws, he or she can set up a panel, especially of agency personnel, secretaries and commissioners, to advise him or her about how to do it. You really can't say that that, that, that panel doesn't exist anymore because that's the governor's right. constitutional authority to set that up. So if you want that panel to serve the same functions as the legislative entity that's created, you can't really say that, you can't really mandate that. Mm -hmm. Well, Governor, you ne need to take your constitutionally created body and serve. And it's just, but it's an intent statement. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, because execution of this is through the, the governor, through the agency heads, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's very, very likely that the governor's executive order committee is going to be serving these purposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's should I move on? Um, so on page six, section three, you're now entering the Chemicals of High Concern to Children program. Do people know what that program is? No, it predates okay. most everybody on this committee. Not me, not you. Sure. I don't remember all that well. Um, I'm happy for, for refreshing. So, it's a requirement in Title 18 that a manufacturer of a children's product that includes one or more of 66 listed chemicals of high concern to children give a notice to the Department of Health that their product includes that chemical of high concern to children. The Department of Health would have authority to add more chemicals to those 66 chemicals. In addition, under existing law, if upon the recommendation of a working group, uh, the commissioner could also adopt a rule to regulate the sale or labeling of a children's product that contained a chemical of high concern to children. There are a lot of definitions in this 
law, children, children's product, chemical of high concern. Um, they are not currently in S55 because S55 amends sections that are outside the definition section. But you may have questions about what those definitions are. Um, so once the commissioner receives that notification from a manufacturer, um, what's what does the health department then do? I mean, how is the public notified? The Department of Health maintains a database of all products that are reported. Um, a person can go into that database. Currently, the products are listed by class and not necessarily by product name. Um, and so you uh, may need to do some additional research to determine whether the product that you want to buy is specifically listed. So is, is there any required labeling uh, on the product itself of Not these chemicals? Not currently under state law, but that is part of the authority that's given to the commissioner through rulemaking. And part of what S55 is doing is changing the standard or the authority for the commissioner to adopt a rule to prohibit the sale of or require the labeling of that product. There may be separate labeling requirements under federal law, consumer product safety, etc., but not necessarily. In addition, this our the state program, Chemical of High Concern Children Program, is modeled to a large extent off of Washington State's program. And Washington State's program has been adopted almost entirely by Oregon. Um, and so there are states that, other states that have um, this type of program. It was the stated intent of the committees when they, they adopted this that it, it comply or conform with Washington State and other states as much as possible. Um, so should I move on? Okay. I think so. So you in section three, you'll see that there's a change to the notice that's provided by the manufacturer of that children's product with the chemical of high concern to children. And right now, that you'll see that the notice is supposed to include the name of the chemical used or produced, its abstract registry number, the description of the product or a product containing, containing the chemical. And now what would be added would be the brand name, the product model, and the universal product code, if the product has such a code in order to provide that additional refinement of information regarding the product for public use. They also need to provide the amount of the chemical uh, in the product and the name, address, and of the manufacturer and a contact for that. Any other information the department requires. Um, and that's basically what is being changed. So what is being added is to have the brand name, product model, and UPC code if a UPC code exists. Then you get to section four. This is the Commissioner of Health's authority by rule to include additional chemicals on the list of 66 chemicals. Right now, the standard is that the Commissioner on the basis of the weight of credible scientific information has determined that a chemical proposed meets certain criteria. Um, the proposal from the Senate is to change it from the weight of to on the basis of credible peer-reviewed scientific information has determined that the, chem that the chemical meets the two criteria. Carl. I believe this was the sticking point last year. In a nutshell, that's the, the issue before us, right? It's, it's one of the major issues before you. And I, I would say that, that people get hung up on the weight of. You, you get people saying that they saw Perry Mason 
you know, or, or you know, LA law, and the, about that the weight of means more than 50%. And my response to that is weight of is not defined in this. And so it's up to the agency that, that has the authority to, to interpret and apply this law to, to interpret what weight of means. If you look at how other science and environmental based agencies define weight of, it is not just about more than 50%. I can give you a document that EPA produces about what weight of means, what weighing means, what weight means. It's about 80 pages long. Um, and so. Do you have the spark notes of it? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do have, a, they do have a little uh, diagram um, that it's like a little triangular diagram. I can, I can provide that. Um, so, what I, my point is that because it's not defined, it's up to the department to define it, or you to further define, or you to change the standard. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean weight. It doesn't mean necessarily 50.001 or more. Um, is, do you have the same or similar in terms of? What the difference between evidence and peer review in from the difference between scientific evidence or peer reviewed scientific information? Well, part of the reason that it's being proposed for amendment this way is to provide that conformity with Washington State and all four of them. This, <coughs> this is the standard that they use for adding a chemical by rule to the list in Washington. Because Oregon Wholesale Incorporates Washington program, Oregon has the same standard. So that that is part of the reason that it's being added this way. And so if we wanted to get information on what that meant, we oh, you, need you, to go to um, have someone from Oregon or. Well, I would. There's a there's a great resource in Washington State. I would have her okay. um, um, contact. Just remembering a little bit of the controversy. I mean, you're going to hear about it from from many from, of these. From, from right. my <laughs> friends. Exactly. Um, How long has that been the the, um, the standard in Washington? Uh, I, from my knowledge, from the day the rule, and it was a rule that has the standard. The day the rule was adopted, which was a couple of years before we adopted this program. So it's been in force for a couple of years, so that we have some. Right. So you adopted this program in, in um, it was effective June of 2014. It was enacted in 2013. Um, and Washington's program was already in existence at that time. Mm -hmm. What would you say, Washington? I mean, yeah. the, the current language that is has to be changed is the weight of credible scientific information, right? Right. That's what the commissioner is supposed to base his, his decisions on. Right? Yes. And that's that's our, what we do currently, is that correct? The, the weight of, that's correct. Okay. And, and the, what they want to do here is change it to peer review scientific, peer review Information. Yeah. Um, okay. Should I move on? Uh, I just ask one more? Uh, not quite yet, Carl. Uh, the '66 chemicals they I lost uh, track of. They were identified by the federal government or by the state. <clears throat> they were the list of '66 chemicals that top that Washington had listed at the time that Vermont enacted it. And we instead of Washington, I mean Washington. Washington State. State. Okay. Hmm. So now the that federal list, government has, has not spoken or listed their chemicals of interest? The federal government doesn't have the same type of program. Mm -hmm. Now Washington's list is not exactly the same as the 66 list anymore because they removed a couple of chemicals and then they added they added two more, they were proposing two more. I have to check and see if they actually got the, the last two proposed on. 
but they're, they're, the list isn't exactly the same as Washington's list anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, do we review these in terms of whether they are considered by the federal government grass, meaning generally accepted as safe or not? Um, so uh, the, the, that standard um, is not part of this law. At the moment. At the moment. About whether or not it is about whether the the product has one of these listed chemicals, not whether or not it's generally regarded as safe in an amount or at all. Um, so that that is not part of the program. Thank you. So moving on, yeah. um, I just want to note that. The commissioner, in reviewing the credible peer-reviewed scientific information, has to determine that an authoritative governmental entity or accredited research institute university has demonstrated that the chemical harms the normal development of a fetus or child, causes cancer, genetic damage, or reproductive harm, or disrupts the endocrine system, or damages the nervous system, immune system, or organs, or is a persistent bioaccumulative toxic. And then they also have to determine, based on their review of that information, whether the chemical has been found through biomonitoring to be present to, in human blood, umbilical cord, br blood, breast milk, urine, or other bodily tissues or fluids, sampling to, that it's present in the house, or monitoring that it's present in fish wildlife for the natural environment. So it's not just whether the commissioner says that there's credible peer-reviewed scientific information, they need to make those two findings. He needs, he needs to make those two findings, okay. that it, it presents a harm and that it's present in the blood, body, household, or environment based on that information. Mm -hmm. And then you get to sub D. So currently there is a chemical of high concern to children working group. It is not the working group that we talked about in sections one and two. That is about an interagency group that's going to um, coordinate chemical management across the state, identify chemical inventories, and those chemical inventories are potentially thousands more chemicals than the 66 that are listed and the chemicals of high concern to children program. This is just about those 66 <coughs> chemicals and children's products that may contain one of those chemicals. And that working group right now um, has to, in order for the commissioner to adopt a rule to regulate the sale or distribution of a children's product, they ha he or she needs to the recommendation of the chemicals of high concern to children working group. So right now it says the commissioner, upon the recommendation of the working group, may adopt a rule to regulate the sale or distribution. Um, and so what is being proposed is that it be after consultation with the working group, may adopt a rule to regulate the sale or distribution of the children's product. Um, people are going to tell you that that uh, the you know that this is a unique structure of the existing law. I think it is a unique structure, but I also think you have the authority to say that the commissioner can't act unless there's a recommendation from this working group. It's really a policy decision as opposed to a legal decision. Can I ask uh, a quick question? Um, so that that. Chemicals of high concern to children working group is different than the citizen advisory panel. Yes, citizen advisory panel only serves the interagency uh, committee on chemical management, and this is a separate working group. That citizens advisory panel for the interagency committee, the, their jurisdiction is much broader because there are that there are literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of chemicals that could be subject to that interagency's review. There's only 66 chemicals that are involved in this program. 
And this chemicals of high concern to children working group is not a subsection of that citizen advisory panel. No, it is not. And so what happens if these two groups happen to be in conflict with one another? Well, both of them are effectively um, advisory bodies. Mm -hmm. So it's about <coughs> what authority the ultimate entity, the department, um, or this interagency committee has. The interagency committee, which is served by the Citizens Advisory Panel, their only authority is, is advisory. They can only recommend changes. Well, that seems to be similar to this group. Well, the commissioner, this group is serving the commissioner. Who can and, make regulatory changes. And the commissioner has rulemaking authority, so the commissioner has ability to, to adopt law. And so does the commissioner have to do that in consultation with that other group as well that he or she is a member of? No. Or So it can, it's a sort of a, a separate there are two capacity. separate programs, right. Okay. And, and you should know that there are other entities and committees in the state that have authority over chemical use as well, like the Pesticide Advisory Council. They're, 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 they're separate, but they may have some authority that looks like it's overlapping, but they are truly separate. So I guess I'm presuming that the secretaries or commissioners in those other departments may have other advisory committees besides this citizen advisory committee to advise them on toxic chemicals. Yes, I mean, the, the, the Secretary of Agriculture, the Pesticide Advisory Council, the Agency of Agriculture, almost every agency of agriculture in the country is the entity that regulates pesticides in that state. That's how it is in Vermont. And there's an advisory council made up of state employees and private employees that advises the Secretary of Agriculture on how to regulate pesticides. That is separate from this chemicals of high concern to children. It is separate from the Interagency Committee on Chemical Management. It is about that council's, they have regulatory authority. They have the ability to, to make recommendations and, and to, they have a little bit more regulatory weight than, than, um, than the Interagency Committee on Chemical Management. Should I move on? So instead of upon the recommendation, it's after consultation with the working group and the standard that would need to be shown is also being changed currently there needs to be a determination that children will be exposed to a chemical of high concern to children, and that there is a probability that due to the degree of exposure or frequency of exposure, the child, um, the, that the exposure could cause or contribute to one or more of the adverse health impacts listed. And we went through those already. Um, what is being proposed is that it should not be that children will be exposed, but that ch children may be exposed. There's the argument that will um, requires a certainty and that there needs to be a, a less stringent standard there. And then the ar argument for removing there is probability. Um, that is also an argument that that is too high of a standard um, to, to show and would likely never be met. Um, so they're being removed. Uh, the, you still, the commission would still need to, in their determination, determine whether children may be exposed to a high, uh, chemical of high concern in children's product and review specific information related to that. Uh, can you go up to, what is the difference between upon the recommendation of, in terms of actual and, and and after consultation with the argument was the upon the recommendation required the approval of the working group in order for the commissioner to go forward with rulemaking whereas consultation does not require approval so is it possible under this new language 
the proposed change. That the commissioner might add a chemical that the chemical supply concern for children working group had not listed. And conversely, is it possible that the com commissioner um, would not put, um, would not do any regulation? Even yes. It? So yes. It's, it's either possible. Yes. The commissioner could. Uh, may want to propose additional chemicals to the list or may want to regulate the sale or distribution of a, of a children's product. Um, for the sale or distribution of a children's product, the commissioner would not need the approval of the working group. The commissioner would just need to consult with the working group. The working group could oppose the commissioner's action, but the commissioner should, could still go forward. Likewise, the, the working group could recommend action um, and uh, the commissioner would not need to act to address that issue the bill includes on page 10 a provision that the chemicals of high concern to children working group may at its discretion submit to you the recommendations or information from a consultation provided to the commissioner so if they the commissioner consults with them and they recommend something that the commissioner disagrees with, they can report to you what their recommendation is. Um, the only other change is, is removing a obsolete uh, date for the additional rules. And, um, oh, actually, there is, there is an additional rulemaking directive. Part of the, one of the questions in the Senate was what happens if a, if a manufacturer wants to introduce their product into the state between the reporting dates? Um, should they be required to report to the department prior to sale or at the next subsequent reporting date? Um, there was some discussion about that and what was uh, concluded was that that should be addressed in rulemaking. So the rulemaking shall include requirements for when or how a manufacturer of a children's product that contains a chemical of high concern to children provides notice when the manufacturer intends to introduce the product for sale between the required dates for reporting. And then you get the rulemaking date for that rule on or before January 1, 2020, they shall adopt that rule. And then the effective dates, uh, everything takes effect well, the Interagency Committee on Chemical Management takes effect on passage and all other sections take effect July 1, 2019. So it seems like there's, there's um, another um, change that we didn't really talk about um, when it's talking on, at the bottom of page 8. Um, so the switch from children will to children may be exposed to chemical high concern. And so and then the striking out of that a high probability that it will result in adverse health experience. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially we're saying instead of meeting a two-part test of exposure and health impact, it's just may be exposed. Is that, am I reading that correctly? That is correct. That, that I did reference that that standard is being changed because it's, uh, there's testimony that it would be impossible to meet. To meet. That the mm. cause and effect part. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What cause and effect? That the ch child will be exposed. Um, you would have to show that a child that there's certainty of that, and that there's probability that the child um, that it, the exposure could cause or contribute to one or more of the adverse <clears throat> health effects listed. And so the concept is that that how do you show probability? Um, the commission would have to, it's a potentially a very high standard. And so the argument is with those combined right now, it would be very, very difficult for the commissioner to adopt a rule that met those standards. Uh, anything else? What effect would the 
emphasis have on interstate commerce of products? In other words, uh, let's say that, well, I, I, this is not not to worry about it. I'll, I'll worry about that later. Well, and we can circle back to that. My my understanding from your walkthrough is this does not prohibit the sale of anything. Currently, there is no product that's prohibited underneath this program. The commissioner would have authority to require labeling of or to prohibit um, the sale of a product in the state. The constitutional slash interstate commerce clause issues would arise under whatever that rule would provide. Um, there has been uh, requirements in Vermont for the labeling of products that are sold into the state, especially when they may include something hazardous. Mercury lighting is an example of that. Um, and the uh, Second Circuit found that that was not a violation of the Commerce Clause. If uh, producers of products that had that, that chemical in it didn't want to label, uh, they didn't need to sell their product in the state. They didn't. They didn't need to sell their product in the state. Um, you would have similar analysis for a ban on a product. Um, the, the, the provision there would probably address some different arguments. Um, we don't have as much of a precedent for that in Vermont. Uh, but there are provisions in other precedent in other states where states can prohibit the sale of, of certain materials when there's a legitimate state interest to do so. Thank you. There's a, there is a requirement in existing law that the Commissioner of Health shall adopt rules by July 1st, 2017. Did the commissioner help? Yes. Oh. Yes, they did. They did. You said they did adopt. They rules. they did adopt rules, and it's it's an ongoing process. They have they have been revising rules, proposing rules changes. They they have made the adopted a rule. So what are the areas of question? What I mean, maybe this is the first run through you've had. Uh, but one, while well, we have let counsel here for a moment, what <coughs> in this first run through is just questions about what it means. Um, I'm just sort of picking up on um, the question that Carl was asking around the commerce issues is, and, and what, and trying to understand what you said. So, would the commissioner be able to, by rule, say products can, instead of banning products, say products containing, so rather than listing out what those products might be, because they could be anything, but um, could they prohibit products that contain certain toxins? Um, by, can they do that by rule, and is that any interference with the commerce law? I mean, like, so you can't, we can't have products that contain lead, Mm -hmm. Or at least I'm presuming for for children's <laughs> toys. For children's toys, yes. So. Um, th there's an allowable level of lead in some children's toys under federal law. Uh, there's a state law that regulates the amount of lead in children's jewelry, um, which is different. And I think we defined it as children under three, mm -hmm. if I recall, unless it changed. So the, the rulemaking authority is for the regulation of the sale or distribution of the children's product. Mm -hmm. So I do think the commissioner would have some authority to do categories of the children's product that contain a chemical of high concern. Um, but I don't know, and it would really depend on what the commissioner was proposing to say 
every product. Or it, I, I think the broader the the rulemaking, the regulation would be, the greater the commerce clause issue would be. But I can't really address that because I don't have a rulemaking. I don't have a proposal in front of me. I I do have the the Nima versus Sorel case where the state said you can't sell your mercury lamp in the state unless it's labeled with the mark HG. And the Second Circuit said that that was permissible state regulation that did not violate the Commerce Clause. It applied to in-state manufacturers, in-state sale, it applied to out-of-state manufacturers who wanted to sell in Vermont. We had similar discussions about the labeling of food that's produced with genetic engineering. It applied to in-state and out-of-state for any food that was sold in the state that was produced with genetic engineering. That case ultimately wasn't decided by the district court because the federal government preempted all state regulation. But the judge at that time had indicated that it was likely that the, it was going to be withheld on Commerce Clause grounds except that I screwed up on one thing. She basically said Ledge Council screwed up on one part of it. Um, but it would have been something that we could have fixed. That we could have done. Yeah, we could have. It was it was re regarding the extraterritorial limitation on advertising, <clears throat> and the way I drafted that was a little bit too broad. And she said it had an extraterritorial effect, and that we could have fixed that pretty easily. Under existing law, what would you the commissioner make, might add chemicals right now. And so my question is, has, in the, whether you know, in the list of chemicals that are existed right now, and I'm presuming the commissioner has a list of chemicals. The list is in statute. The list is in, has the um, commissioner adopted, since the rules, the chemicals that are in statute, has the commissioner added any? Not to my knowledge, no. Or proposed to add any. Oh, we have a. Um, okay, we're opening this up. Yes. Oh, uh, I was just. I'll address with the AIB. Just help me with my cat. There's a. There's a pending rule that adds about 20 chemicals. Okay. There's a pending rule. Um, it's in the rulemaking process. Is it in the public comment process? Comments that they received. So what? What product is there? Or what? What chemical? About 20. So, um, so I don't know whether I would get them from you or get them from the Commissioner of Health. I would be interested in knowing what the um, comments have been around the chemicals which this current um, Commissioner has um, put forward in terms of rulemaking under, the, under this. So I'd be curious as to what. Do you, should I ask the Commissioner of Health, or is that something that led to Council? I can get them for you, especially if it's in the public comment. I'm sorry, I did not know about the proposed rule. Uh, David Englander is also the oh, okay. person okay. Uh, for the agency, for the department on this. Okay, thank you. I understand you one of the major concerns with these changes, even though they seem small when sentences and things like that. That is that so many of our products today contain trace amounts of so many chemicals that when you go ahead and change the wording from will in that one line to may, uh, it opens up really a wide range of Pandora's box. I guess the best way to describe it is to what, what people could suggest were possibly harmful levels, even if uh, uh, they couldn't get into a child's uh, hands, or uh, is my understanding one of the major concerns in this bill, the way it was presented and the way it's being presented now, the way I understand. So, so there, there are de minimis, there's two de minimis levels. Um, so if the product contains um, 
the chemical at or below one of the de minimis standards, which is uh, if it's at a concentration um, of 100 parts per million, it has to be present at 100 parts per million or greater, or it was intentionally added to the children's product at a level above the PQL, and that is the practical quantification limit, which means the lowest concentration that can be reliably measured within specific specify them as a precision accuracy representativeness, completeness, and comparability. But that that is partly what you were asking about, whether or not there is a, a de minimis okay. standard. And so you're saying it's 100 parts per, per billion, per, per, per million, per million. Per million, okay. And so there, there's that de minimis standard. But your other point was that should these products be reported if there's no exposure pathway to a child, and that, that was part of the initial policy decision among the General Assembly and among the, the legislative committees. That that's a policy decision. Like cell phones have an incredible number of well, chemicals in them. Well, there there is an extensive list of things that are accepted mm -hmm. from the definition of what is a children's product. Um, Sometimes not a children's. It's it's not really? those <laughs> not those things used for industrial or, or business purposes. It's, it's not a food or a beverage. It's not a tobacco product. It's not a pesticide. It's not a, a drug or biologic rec regulated by FDA. It's not ammunition, firearms, air rifles, etc. It's not aircraft, motor vehicle, wheelchairs, or vessels. You know, we all know about that child aircraft. That, <laughs> uh, it's, it's not about consumer electronic products, um, it's not about interactive software, and it's not about packaging. Those are all not regulated. In addition, batteries are not regulated, no sporting equipment's not regulated, inaccessible components of a consumer product uh, that may, in its reasonable foreseeable use, would not come into direct contact with the child's skin or mouth. That is not regulated. And used consumer products that are sold in a secondhand product market are not regulated. What you're reading there is not in the bill. It's not in the bill. It's in the underlying law. So, uh, in the underlying law. Okay. All right. And the underlying law is what again? So uh, You would want to look at Title 18, Chapter 38A. And I was just re reading from Section 1772. There's two definitions that are relevant, the definition of consumer product and the right definition of children's product. Depending upon how our understanding of this proposed legislation goes, we might need you to situate this in the chapter. Mm -hmm. This Things like this yeah. being one of those um, Understood. things that um, not that we can't discuss them, but it's like that's it's not, you know, it's already in law. Mm -hmm. We'll see how it's been worked, whatever, those kinds of things. You began, and I was a little distracted, um, and you talked about definitions that aren't defined in here, but they're are they defined elsewhere, like like a child and things yes. like that. And so are they elsewhere in statute in in, in this statute? And so they they, they are in. They are not in S55. They are in the chapter that I just okay. referenced. Uh, a child means an individual under 12 years of age. Um, and there's so definitions for children's jewelry. There's definitions of what a contaminant is. There's definition of what a manufacturer is. There's definition of what's persistent and bioaccumulative, because that's one of the standards. There's a definition of what a toy is. Um, but there, there are a lot of definitions for this. Does program. it define what a cell phone is? No, but it would, uh, in my opinion, fall under a consumer electronic product, which includes personal computers, AV equipment, calculators, wireless telephones, game consoles, and handheld devices incorporating a video screen. And those are not subject to Other 
questions right now for legislative council. Um, yes. Uh, uh, it's too far afield. Uh, no, it's not. Go ahead. Ask it. No, I was just wondering. I mean, obviously, we've had a lot of discussion about certain devices that are used by dentists and possible consequences and other health related things. So let's say fillings that a dentist would use and products that may be in that, how, how would they be viewed under this? Well, you have to look at the definition of what is a children's product. It's any consumer product marketed for use by, marketed to, sold, offered for sale, or distributed to children in the state. It includes toys, children's cosmetics, children's jewelry, or a product designed or intended by the manufacturer to help with, with sucking yeah. or teething. Well, it sounds like it's not in, in there, obviously. Right, and, and then I would just go back to a drug or biologic regulated by the FDA. Is mercury fillings regulated by the FDA? I, I would have to check on that. So, Carl, I mean, these, Carl, your question is not far afield. I mean, one of the things I am sure that will be part of our discussion or people's understanding mm -hmm. of the bill, mm -hmm. of the proposed legislation, is what is the universe yeah. that this is going to impact? And, um, right. well, that's um, and, and, and I, I, I am somewhat speaking from experience when regulating children's toys under three, um, a certain retail type of establishment was convinced that this would prevent a time-honored um, tradition in Vermont. And so I walked into the store and I said, show me the toys. But they were convinced. I mean, until I was you know, so I think it's important to outline, I mean, to ask these questions that we have, because, yeah. you know, we don't know. Um, but maybe, because some of us are not, there are A, some people who are not here, but if you could pull out, maybe tend to Julie, um, the section on definitions and sure. things like that, that sure. might help. And, and the spark notes <laughs> for the report. I mean, if, I mean, I imagine <laughs> the, the triangle. The triangle. The triangle. Oh, sure. The, I mean, um, yeah. I, I, I've been told ideas. that cliff notes are no longer, which is what gotcha. once upon a time, and gotcha. I've been told they're now spark notes for those of us who maybe not can't read the. I mean, cliff notes don't exist anymore. There's, what, what sort of notes? I was told by one of my students in my other life that no, it's not cliff notes, it is now called spark notes, and you can buy them in Barnes and Noble and get them online. Um, but um, that, because I am assuming that that, well, no, maybe I should say, did that 80 page report have any. Anything? It was looked at last year uh -huh. by the Senate committee. Mm -hmm. I don't recall that being looked at this year. Might it inform our thoughts on this? I think it inform, can, will inform your thoughts on. On the purpose and what this whole well, thing is. Well, if, if you leave weight of evidence yeah. in statute, what discretion would an administrative agency have in defining what that means? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it goes beyond the Perry Mason, you need more than 50 point zero there. It's, it's, a, it's a more science-based analysis. I mean, that would probably, from my point of view, committee, I don't know if that would help you to under, to, to get some information as to what those different words mean. What does weight mean? Weight of evidence. What is What does peer review mean? And how does that impact information versus evidence or whatever? Because um, that seems to be, as you pointed out, Carl, one of the places of contention. So words matter. And so let's know what they mean. 
So you're suggesting that we're prepared to get the 70 page thing? We're prepared to report. No, I'm suggesting. I, I, I'm the not. The report I'm referencing is the U.S. EPA report. U.S. EPA, EPA Environmental yeah. Protection Agency. Um, so maybe if you, for, for the um, overachievers on the committee and for anyone who go, goes on our webpage, if you could forward the full report sure. to um, Julie and then perhaps come back at some in the very near future we'll, when we have it back on the agenda. Um, maybe review with us the cute little chart. Sure. We'll do. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the way or the weighing or the weight. Uh-huh. Okay. Again, Julie, when you when you do this, we need help. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're Appreciate do it. Do you need me to stay or um a committee um we what is your druthers right now in terms of where we I'm no one else at this point was um, on the list to testify. I don't want to put anyone on. We don't have anything on our schedule in terms of a person coming in until 3, I think. 3.30. Until 3.30, because we thought we might be on the floor. Um, I don't know, God, let you loose and have you get into trouble, or whether to <laughs> check in and see if there is anyone who is sitting around the table right now, around the audience, who is prepared and would um, appreciate the opportunity to comment on this now. Don't worry, you'll have another chance. But if anyone is currently ready. Okay, God. Mm -hmm. so all the what? interest, I no know. one is ready. ready. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, I guess not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. you can go back to wanton waste. No, I don't really want to. <laughs> <laughs> so, was this a committee bill? No. no, I believe it was. Um, no, I've got it. Uh, um, uh, Lions and Campion. Okay. Yeah, that's what it says. Yeah. Oh, there. Yeah. All right. Lions. So, um, okay. no. Um, yeah. Okay. So, what I would. Um, Who do you need to be hearing from? You all, okay, let's let's go around the people. Okay, you want. To, okay, how many of you are wanting to testify? Okay. Okay, we'll make a little line to to um to, to Julie. Um, uh, let me um. It's April 9th. I believe we'll be getting out in May, in early May. Pinky uh, <laughs> <laughs> cross, please. Um, Are you giving us some information for the pool? No. Oh. I, I have no. You know, and I, but I was in the top half of the. Um, of the basic oh, yeah. of the basic oh, yeah. well, well, I think exactly at the top half. I think I was, you know. 36. Um, for those of you who are, who are around, who are sitting around, are there people who are not your compatriots or others who you know want to testify but have sent you here to report back so that we know? A picture of the Toy Association. Oh, goody. Uh, Matt Lentz is the state director. He's based out of Providence, Rhode Island, so he would like the opportunity to testify. A long time. And then your folks want to testify as well. No, that's oh, that's that your is folks. Oh no, I, I mean what yeah. I meant is, you know, sometimes, sometimes, you know, we're all family here, and sometimes another. Oh. You, you're reporting. For my you, team. That's yeah, it. yeah. That's all I'm asking. You know, and and you were you were all in the room, and rooms in the Senate. So is there a voice? I'm really asking for your mutual help. Is there a voice that is missing that we need to hear from? Anybody from? I think that they're probably are. We probably want to ask them before we volunteer their names. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Okay. Well, actually, even if they testify, we'll have it on the list. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, How right. about somebody from academia? Someone from academia? Um, well, to possibly testify on this issue of peer review versus on the okay. weight of evidence. Okay. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm assuming we're hearing from the health department. Yes. Does Ag want to? Our other, our other, because there was Ag. There's on. You're, you're, you're. Okay. Ag left. Ag left. Oh. Pick <laughs> up board. Preferably a physics professor. A physics professor? Preferably. What, now, why physics? <laughs> It's the basic science. So that we can find out what the weight of evidence is. Right. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, okay. I, anybody from the, you know, the hard sciences, I guess. Yeah, I'd yeah. Be interested in. I will not have someone who does research in the Department of Social Work. Oh, no, in <laughs> I, I did that last time too. <laughs> okay. Why don't we why don't we take a break and come back at three and we'll have a little time to maybe figure out what the rest of our life is or talk about um, where you want to go with your issue. Sure. Okay. Um, and then um, at three thirty, um, Bryn is going to do a walkthrough of um, Proposition Five. Okay, so see you all back at three. Oh, okay, now back to why you're really here. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks for the heads up on that. Work on that. So <clears throat> you have um, Proposition Five before you, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about how we developed it in committee, mm -hmm. and then I'll answer questions that you might have. Um, the, the language. I'm, I'm going to stop you for okay. a second. Um, do tell us the process you went through. Mm -hmm. I don't, committee, this is as much for you as anyone else. I don't want you to start asking too many questions of the senator before the we expert, had a walkthrough. Right, the expert is over here. Yeah, and, and so, so maybe, you know, we may go back and forth. Right, so um, I understand that you've looked at the process for. Uh, that a constitutional amendment goes through. Yep. And so we looked at that as well. Um, the, the Health and Welfare Committee had Proposition 5, so it was our responsibility to take the language and to ensure two things about that I, that I believe are, were important in the development of the language. One is that it's legally defensible and two, that it, um, that it it says what we want it to say, that it's narrow enough and specific enough, and yet reflects uh, what we believe to be a fundamental right. So as you're talking with Bryn, you can look to see um, the meaning of those two things that I'm talking about. We spent a great deal of time uh, debating the specific language in the proposal in the article, um, and we spent some time looking at the purpose section. As you know, constitutional amendments do not always have a purpose section. We felt that it was critically important to uh, have a purpose section to explain exactly what we meant in the constitutional amendment so that it would be derived from, or at least foreshadowed in other um, articles in the Constitution. So Article 22 does have a pur purpose section with it. As you know, the purpose section is not included uh, when it is voted on by the voters. So should this go through the whole process, through the next biennium, it's only the article that's voted on. Um, so our work on the article itself was to narrow it to a single sentence and to ensure that the concepts that we wanted to have included are included, so a fundamental right to personal reproductive autonomy, that, um, that, became, it, that became important to us. Um, and it's central to the, I'll, I'll let you, I'll let Brent walk you through it, but um, 
we did take out the first section and the first sentence and integrated it into the single sentence. So as you go through it, you may see the, the language that we changed. I don't know how far you're going to go through all the language changes that we made. Um, and then we did take out in our proposal of amendment on the floor um, a reference to the Constitution because folks felt that that was somewhat confusing. So all in all, the committee listened to um, um, people who we felt uh, could contribute to the meaning of the of the statement of the article, um, and that we that we are assured um, by Ledge Council and others that this is perfectly legally defensible and that it does reflect a fundamental right to personal autonomy, reproductive liberty. So I, I know I don't know what more you would like me to say. There's a lot more that could be said, but I think that's kind of the gist of how we functioned. So um, am I clear that, understanding in terms of what you are saying, that while, while whoever initially proposed this, Senator Ash and you and whatever. Oh, let me do, go back a little further. Okay, so, I mean, so it, it, it's <laughs> not in the same process. I mean, it's, it doesn't look exactly the same. You it, guys took testimony and made changes? Yes, so as it was initially drafted, um, I and others worked from last summer on the language. And so the language that was introduced had already been vetted by a number of people, including lawyers. And then as we looked at it in committee, we realized that there were some changes that would improve the article. Mm -hmm. So in committee, as we took testimony and we talked with ledge counsel, we made changes so that it was changed from two sentences initially, from two sentences in the article, to a single sentence. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we took the phrase out uh, as protected in this constitution. We took that phrase out. So now you're, you are left with a single sentence um, that reflects the original intent, as, as folks built it, mm -hmm summer and fall and um, and includes what we think is a very um, strong and resilient article for our Constitution. No. When, you, when you took testimony, who did you take testimony from? Well, I, I'm happy to get you the list. So we took, we took testimony from um, the Attorney General, the Solicitor General, uh, our Ledge Council, uh, Planned Parenthood, uh, right to Life, ACLU, Human Rights Commission, Vermont Medical Society, a representative from the Medical Society. And I'm trying to think if I'm missing someone. Might be a couple others. We were, we were, we didn't open it up to a um, to a public hearing because it's not the kind of thing that really lends itself to a public hearing. We get it, to have it's, one. You, you get to have because it's but, part of the process. Yeah, really, it, this is uh, um, the intent is to provide for reproductive liberty, personal autonomy. autonomy. Uh, we our our interest was in ensuring that what we currently have in the state of Vermont, what we've had for the past forty-five years, more or less. Um, is is placed into the Constitution because we know there are threats as well as, as you folks know there's threats to um, reproductive liberty. So Jenny, thank you. Um, I don't know if you have time to stay but we probably need to walk through unless there are que questions for what the process was. And, yeah, uh, and I'm creating. happy to answer questions and I'll, I'll defer to Bryn when we get to vetted. Go ahead. Senator, we, we passed a piece of, we, we passed a bill out of here. Yes, you did. And on the floor, and it was, it's over in the Senate. Is there a reason why that is not coming forward instead of this? Um, first of all, this is an S. So it started as a Proposition 5 in the Senate, as all, all 
constitutional amendments must begin in the Senate. H57 is an H bill, and after crossover, we're looking at it. So you'll see it's on our it's on our agenda on Friday. Um, some of us are 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 us looking for um, further action. Is that right? On that? I'm I'm wondering why we we don't do that. Finish that job first. That seemed to be what everybody wanted. So um, are you saying that people would rather have a law than an article in the Constitution? I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is we worked hard on a bill. And we're we very appreciative passed. of the work that you did and what you have sent to us. In fact, the um, public hearing you had, we have, we have a list of everyone who testified. We have all that testimony and we'll be, at least I will, uh, be looking at and, and reviewing all of that testimony as we take up age 57. I don't know what more you're asking at this point. I mean, if no, you would no, rather, I only have one if question. you would, I mean, the, so I think that a, a, an article in the Constitution is much more powerful than a law that can be, um, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't have both. It's simply because right now this proposal should you folks act on it and send it to the house for a vote and then it, it won't go to the people until after we both the senate and the house vote again in the next biennium so i see the law as critical to supporting uh, this over the next couple of years three or four years and then being a uh, law that's on the books. Well, is it, is it, is age 57. I mean, is it, is it fair, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, so tell me um, that these go hand in hand. Of course that, they that do. The, um, Absolutely. That, the con that one, the constitutional amendment is going to the voters to ultimately see if um, the voters, to enshrine a value. I mean, a constitution doesn't set in place law and what to do, and that is what H-50 so or nine. I, I guess we have the right, excuse me. Mm -hmm. We have the right to We have the right right now. Women have the right. We do. Right now, without so a law, without anything. So, so remember, the fundamental right to reproductive liberty includes what? The right to choose or refuse contraception. The right to choose or refuse sterilization. The right to be pregnant and carry pregnancy to term. Or the right to choose to have an abortion. Those are the things that we would like to protect okay. in the in the Constitution. And the bill that that you pass to us and that we will be considering over the next few weeks, that bill is critical to laying the groundwork. Should a constitutional amendment be approved by the voters? So, as as Representative Pugh has said, these two things go together. We know that there is a threat at the federal level. What's happening with the Trump administration is ominous. We know that the Supreme Court, it's just a matter of time before Roe v. Wade is overturned. And I encourage you to talk with Ledge Counsel about the difference between the Article 22 that we have and, and, and what other states have that could be in jeopardy should Roe v. Wade be overturned. Our state right now relies very much on what is in Roe v. Wade. So when that goes, H57 and ultimately Article 22 will be what we have in place that reflects what we have done for the past 45 years. Carl. I'm just curious why the word abortion just doesn't appear in Proposition 5. It seems like it's misleading when you talk about this issue with the public. 
that it doesn't include the word abortion. No, I think reproductive liberty is, is broader and it is more reflective of what we wanted to see in a constitutional amendment. There are some articles in the Constitution that are pretty narrow, you know, like the, you have to send your land deed to the town clerk. That's pretty darn narrow. But for us, we felt that reproductive li liberty includes more than that, and it will allow for Supreme Court interpretation going further on those things that come up in the future. So, of course, it includes the right to choose abortion. So it includes the four things that I, I listed, at least. So, and I think um, it isn't only about abortion. It is about family planning. So it's about thinking about when one chooses to use contraception so that one doesn't become pregnant because of either economic or social or, or job concerns. Because you know, when, when, you, when a family decides to, to expand itself, there are a lot of considerations that are put in place. So yeah, I mean, abortion is a piece of it, but it, it's more about family planning and contraception. And if you look at the, at the testimony that you get, and you probably have had it already in this committee, um, contraception was a dirty word in 1965. Yeah, so today, it's, we, we take family planning for granted. So it, it's a good question. But I think that the article allows for um, a more expansive uh, look at reproductive liberty that is consistent with what we would want to see in a, in a constitutional article, article of the Constitution. So, Jin, thank you. And people okay. who are around, the, um, both um, people who support this and people who don't, you are hearing what some of the questions that we have and why sure. is this. Um, why are we doing this? And is this um, too broad or too narrow, or as Carl said, um, confusing? Um, but I think, and Ginny, if you can stay, because I see that Topper and others have um, maybe questions, but I think before we go down the road of questions, it would be helpful if we knew actually what was in it and have Ledge Council walk, walk us through that. So can you, you want me to stay for a little yeah, bit? That Is would that be it? great, because I know that oh. on top of one to continue to ask you some questions. Good afternoon, committee. Good afternoon. Nice to see you all again. For the record, Bryn here from Legislative Council. I'm here to do a walkthrough of Prop 5. Senator did a nice job of introducing it, um, and I will um, go ahead and give the committee a walkthrough. As, as you see, it's quite short, um, and it's worth a read, since much of it is pretty straightforward, but um, I'll do my best to, to give you some context and, and clarity about the language. So section one is the purpose section, and as Senator Lyons mentioned, not um, historically, not all <coughs> Proposals of amendment to the Constitution have included a purpose section. Um, this one does, and um, the discussion and in including the purpose section was really to provide some context um, for the court to use in analyzing the new Article 22, um, and specifically to reflect existing principles and language in the Vermont Constitution that um, offer a backdrop for this uh, newly enumerated right. So it provides that the amendment is in keeping with the values um, espoused in the current Vermont Constitution and that it um, specifically references Chapter 1, Article 1, and that's the language that all persons are born equally free and independent and have certain natural, inherent, and unalienable rights. And it also references Article 7, which is the Common Benefits Clause. And that states the government is or ought to be instituted for the common benefit, protection, and security of the people. And then it goes on to say that the, this newly enumerated right reflects the principles of equality and personal liberty that are reflected in those two articles of the Constitution and to ensure that government doesn't create or perpetuate the legal, social, or economic inferiority of any class of people. And then it provides um, some clarification that nothing in this amendment is intended 
intended to limit the scope of any rights and protections afforded by the Vermont Constitution. And the second subsection here um, is that the right to reproductive liberty is central to the exercise of personal autonomy, it involves decisions people should be able to make free from compulsion of the state, and enshrining the right in the Constitution ensures that um, people are treated equally and upholds the right to all people of health, dignity, independence, and freedom. Section two is the article. Um, so it adds a new article to the Vermont Constitution, the um, right to personal reproductive liberty. And it's one sentence, and I'll just go ahead and read it. That an individual's right to personal reproductive autonomy is central to the liberty and dignity to determine one's own life course and shall not be denied or infringed unless justified by a compelling state interest achieved by the least restrictive means. And as this committee knows in your conversations about um, H57, that standard of scrutiny, that's the strict scrutiny standard that the court uses in analyzing um, a regulation on what the court deems to be a fundamental right. And if you remember our conversation about the fundamental right that was um, discussed in Roe versus Wade was the right to privacy. And Roe versus Wade found Roe versus Wade found that the right to privacy encompassed a woman's right to have an abortion. And it talked about that fundamental right as um, being implicit in the concept of ordered liberty and having to do with that um, area of, of a person's life that included marriage, procreation, child rearing, contraception, and the like. So the article specifically directs the court to use the strict scrutiny standard in analyzing any legislation um, or any regulation <coughs> on the right to personal reproductive autonomy. Can you, <coughs> this is based on <coughs> principles one and seven. I mean, that's in the purpose section. Right, right. So could you, is in the purpose section, I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me. Um, so Article 1 is, states simply that all persons are born equally free and independent. Right, that's, Article 1 is really a general principle, um, it's not a self-executing provision in the Constitution, mm -hmm. it just sort of is a general statement um, that talks about the rights of um, all people in the state. And Article 7 is what is, is what is colloquially known as our um, common benefits, which is somewhat similar to the Equal Protection Clause federally. Yes, that's right. So the Common Benefits Clause is um, the article of the Vermont Constitution that the courts use um, in analyzing whether or not um, a law infringes upon a, an individual liberty, for example. So. A common benefits clause is often um, talked about as sort of <coughs> being Shanghai to use uh, Shanghai for the use of equal protection. So um, the court will use the common benefits clause in doing equal protection analysis, whereas the um, U.S. Supreme Court may use um, the Fourteenth Amendment, due process clause, or equal protection clause. Um, the Vermont Supreme Court will likely use. Common That wasn't in Roe versus Wade that the court uh, did not go and uh, let's say authorize abortion up through the entire term of uh, pregnancy. They just talked about up through essentially up to survivability, is my recollection, and left it up to the states beyond that to to do what they're saying. So they had some concept of the, the <coughs> rights, or what you call it, the common, uh, what was it, clause called, but spoke to not just the the uh, mother or the person carrying the child, but in some ways respecting the the product of uh, a viable fetus. Yes. Does that mean then that's not carried forward in this provision? Uh, that we're talking about here, is that correct? Well, I'm not sure I'm not sure I understand the question. I, I think what Roe versus Wade did was it said that the state did have a compelling interest in um, the, 
potential life of the fetus, and that began at the, at the viability stage. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't preclude a, a Vermont court from finding something similar. Finding something similar, but the wording, I mean, you said that, uh, I'm a little confused on this, but you're, you said that one, in the U.S. Constitution, it was, you used the term common common good or common? Common, common benefits clause? Common benefits clause. Yeah, that's, right. that's the Vermont Constitution. Okay, that's right. the Vermont Constitution. But in the federal Constitution, what was the like thing that you compared it to? Oh, the equal protection clause? Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I think we're, we might be mixing up two different things. If we're talking about Roe versus Wade, mm -hmm. so that, the court in Roe versus Wade found that there was a fundamental right to privacy, mm -hmm. and that right to privacy encompassed the right to an abortion. Mm -hmm. um, but then in, in its analysis, in its specific fact-based analysis, the court said that the state does have a the state doesn't have a compelling interest in regulating the right to abortion during the first trimester because it's um, the procedure is no more dangerous than childbirth birth itself. But then when they went on to talk about when the state does have a compelling interest. They found that the compelling interest comes into play at the stage of viability if that, if that interest is in the potential life of the fetus. I just see some sort of conflict there. I, I don't know how to describe it. Can you pull up on this anyway. so that everyone can see again what this says? So here we, so, um, Carl, see the last phrase in Article 22. Mm -hmm. This right shall not be denied or infringed mm -hmm. unless justified by a compelling state interest achieved by the least restrictive means. So, so your, your reading of that is that it falls within Roe versus Wade interpretation. Is that correct or not? I'm not, I, I wouldn't say that because I think that this is a different, this enumerates, this roots the right somewhere else besides the right to privacy. Instead, it's, it roots the right in the liberty and dignity to determine one's own life course. So rather than, um, rather than establishing the right to personal reproductive autonomy in, in this right to privacy, in the idea of the right to privacy, um, first of all, it enumerates it as its own standalone right in the Constitution, and um, it does not provide for a, a right to privacy as protecting that right. Good. The ability to Term my own, my life's course. Do you see any unintended consequences with the way this is worded for other laws that we've already passed? So are you? So I, I take it you're you're singling out that dignity to determine one's own life course. Correct. I think. So I think that the way that the article is structured is that it provides it sets out the right, it enumerates that right in the first part of the sentence that an individual has a right to personal reproductive autonomy. So that's the new right? That's the right that has to be, that cannot be denied or infringed unless justified by a compelling state interest. <clears throat> that's the enumerated right. So so this is, it's a, this is separate from any other right. Tell me if, what, if I'm tell a lawyer me and I'm arguing this case, would I have any argument with the way this is worded to say, as an example, um, I have uh, a sick relative, and that sick relative needs me to be there, and so I'm going to take off work to be with that sick relative. Would this any of the way this is written, would that allow me to do that? I don't think that it would, no. I think that the, the way the article is structured, first of all, it's titled um, Personal Reproductive Liberty. 
So that sort of sets the context for what the right is about. Okay. And then it, and then that language, I, I think that that language is pretty narrow. It provides for a pretty narrow right that is enumerated there, and that is the right to personal reproductive autonomy. And I don't, and I think that if you're if you're getting at that second clause there is central to the liberty and dignity to determine one's own life course. That's not the enumerated right. The enumerated right is the personal reproductive autonomy language. Okay, then maybe I'll ask the question different, Brent. Are there any other rights like this listed in the Constitution this way? There's there so there is no right to reproductive autonomy in the in the Constitution now, no. And not even uh, so, so this, when Roe versus Wade, when that decision was made, it was, I thought it was based on the, the privacy clause. Right, right. The 14th Amendment included the right to privacy. So there is no specific right to privacy that's enumerated in the U.S. Constitution that the court found. Remember, we talked about that yeah. Roe versus Connecticut case, that there yeah. is a right to privacy. Right. That, it, that encompasses the zone of uh, marriage and procreation. Right. Um, so that was found in the 14th Amendment. So it's not uh, specific. You won't find that word specifically in the Constitution, but based on the U.S. Supreme Court jurisprudence, the court found the 14th Amendment to protect the right to privacy. And what, what is different about the construction of the Vermont proposal? From the... From the people seem to be talking about Roe v. Wade right. and um, the 14th Amendment. And instead, in Vermont, what was? Right, so this would, so this would enumerate a right in the Constitution. In the, and, Vermont or, Constitution. in the Vermont Constitution. And articulate that right as a fundamental right. And specifically direct the court to treat it as a fundamental right by directing the court to use strict scrutiny analysis on any any legislation that would that would infringe upon the right. And, and, and that's okay to do? Direct the court on what they can do and what they can't do? So yes, the way that the way that it's structured, yes, it's okay to articulate a right as a fundamental right and direct the court to treat it as a fundamental right. So but it's up to the court to interpret what it means. It's up to the court to interpret. So are there other articles in the Vermont Constitution that um, that direct a particular standard by the court? I mean, I think that's what Topper is trying to ask. But the, there is not another provision in the Vermont Constitution that directs the court to use the strict scrutiny standard. I believe this would be the first one to do that. And and um, can you re repeat for us, perhaps in a different way, what is the strict scrutiny? I don't see those words there. Sure. Um, so what what that is? Sure. So there are different. Um, different standards of scrutiny or different levels of analysis that a court will undertake when um, analyzing whether a restriction on a fundamental or on any right um, is constitutional. And what I'm calling the strict scrutiny analysis um, is invoked when a law negatively affects a, certain, a fundamental right, what a right that the court has determined to be fundamental or the Constitution sets out as a fundamental right. So strict scrutiny means um, the court's going to analyze the law to determine whether or not the state had a compelling interest in and whether or not that law is written narrowly enough to achieve that interest that the state, to achieve that compelling interest that the state has in regulating the right. So it's sort of a two-part test that the court will do. And then again, it's the highest level of scrutiny that a court will undertake in analyzing a regulation. So let me let me ask another I'm gonna ask another question then related to that. You've talked to me about um, the personal reproductive autonomy and, and I mentioned do you think there are any un, unintended consequences to this? And I gave you one example. 
I'm going to give you another one now because I worked hard on this one too. Um, the death with dignity law. The, I'm not a lawyer. But the way I'm reading this, um, the liberty and dignity to determine one's own life course shall not be denied or fringed upon. That, right? you, so you read well, it. Well, let me finish. Mark. So I'm a person in a tough situation, and I decide I'm not going to ask the doctor for the prescription. I'm just going to deal with it myself, which I can do anyway without asking for that. Um, but there was some protection in that bill so that people wouldn't just do away with somebody else or talk them into doing something. Now, Going to, do you feel that there's any extenuating circumstances with the way this written this is written, so it would throw out that law? Well, what I would say is that a court is not going to look at a phrase within an article of the Constitution and take that phrase out of context and apply it to a set of circumstances that have nothing to do with what the article as a whole seeks to protect. So the article as it's written is titled in a way that signals to the court what the right protects, and then it's phrased in a way that signals to the court that it, the right that's enumerated is the right to reproductive autonomy. And that's the right that's subject to the more rigorous level of analysis if for any legislation that seeks to infringe on that right. So what I'm saying to you is I don't think that a court would draw out that one phrase in the middle of the sentence and apply it in a context that does, has nothing to do with reproductive rights. What if the mother, what if the, the pregnant woman, there was, there was a chance that she might die? Tell, tell me more. So, uh, a woman is trying to make a decision. Does she want to kill herself? Or does she want the baby to be born? I'm having, I'm struggling to answer that question. Well, I'm trying to, the way the thing is written to me is if I'm that woman, I can make that decision because it says I can determine my own life's course. Right, that you have a right to pers personal reproductive autonomy that's central to the liberty oh. and dignity to determine one's own life course. Right. So the question is, the question is, if I'm pregnant, but I have, but I want to kill myself? No. That, that, there may be a chance that I might die when giving birth. You know, for, just for the record, Vermont is one of the, the, the uh, women die too often from giving birth. My point is, if a woman was in a situation like this, and she chose to do that, would there be any, be any problems with it? You know, the article is really structured to um, set up, to establish a fundamental right, and I, I got that. provide a structure for, um, I got that. for the state to in, in passing any regulation on that right, it, it indicates to the to the legislature how they would need to craft legislation. In order okay, to well, I, I get that part, Bernie. I'm, I'm trying to think of extenuating circumstances. I'm the woman, you're the guy, and the guy says, um, I want you to have the baby. And there's a re there may be some kind of reasons why, if that childbirth goes through, that, could, that woman could die. See, I remember when we were having kids and the doctor asking me, hey, if we have a problem here, because we had a problem. And he said, if this gets into a bad situation, which way do you want to go? And I said, I made that decision. I said, you saved my wife because I don't know the baby. Okay? And I'm worried about this thing here, the way this thing is written, where, where that decision can't be made. And, and 
and the woman dies. So am I, under, I'm, am I understanding Did the question? you have something you had, Senator? So, uh, I'm, the, the questions you're asking are really important questions. And um, if a patient who is incapacitated has an agent, in your case, you would be the agent. Yeah, but I wasn't what? officially the agent. But the doctor positive. just came in and asked me. Yeah, so that's different. But we already have laws on the books that look at any particular health care decision-making process, including uh, having a, 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 an agent who is in your advanced directive. That, so it's a, different, it's a different place. This is about the four things that I mentioned before, um, contraception, sterilization, pregnancy, abortion. Those are really, that, that's really the yeah, but it doesn't say that, so. In all due respect. That's not what this says. I'll, I'll let, I'll let, I will let. I don't see the word abortion at all in here. No, it's not. I don't see the word, those other no, three No, it's not. Words. That would narrow this even further. So this is, this is to allow for all those things that one uses through personal reproductive decision making and autonomy to make decisions about one's life course. Can I ask your question in a little bit different way if I'm getting, if I'm trying to get at it? I'm, 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 I'm trying to understand, I'm trying to understand what you're trying to get at. So if, if this is giving an individual, every individual, the right to personal reproductive autonomy, and what if there's a conflict between the rights of two people um, about that reproductive autonomy? So, you know, it could be the father and it could be the mother. One of them wants a baby and the other one doesn't want a baby or there's a health risk for somebody and this one says, well, I don't care if there's a health risk for you, I want you to have the baby. So whose personal reproductive autonomy is going to rule? Okay, so that I, I can understand that. And I, what I would say to that is that the court isn't going to, um, I don't think that a court would rule on a situation like that in a way that would force one person to carry a pregnancy to term who did not want to carry a pregnancy to term. Because in that circumstance, the court would essentially be sabotaging the right that that person had under Article 22 um, to reproductive freedom. So I can't tell you exactly how a court would rule, because I think that those are really factually specific circumstances. But I can say that I, it's very unlikely that a court would rule in a way that would um, directly undermine um, the right to um, have an abortion. It's the, it's the woman who is carrying the fetus didn't want to carry the pregnancy to term. Okay. Uh, you say you don't think, and, and I'm willing to be with you on I don't think. I just gave you a, an example of exactly what happened in my case. That's exactly what happened. The doctor came out of that room and said, asked me that question because there was a problem going on. In the in the, where the baby was being born. Now, how in hell does the where is who get does anybody get in trouble about this? The way this thing is written. I mean, I made a decision. And that doctor listened to me, and he did it. Luckily, everything finally turned out all right. But what I'm worried about is somebody's going to get in trouble here. Are you concerned about the, a, a physician Both. getting in trouble? Both. Under what, under the circumstances? Right now, my understanding from listening to the testimony on the floor was that at the UVM Medical Center, there's certain uh, forms that have to be filled out, certain things have to be met, et cetera, before they'll allow an abortion to take place after 22 or 24 weeks. Now you're, you're beyond the two, 22 to 24 weeks. You're in that, that, that place where the hospital has some rules and regulations. And I step in and make the, the, the doctor comes out of the room. It's OK. You're having the abortion. The doctor comes out of the room and says to me, which way do you want to go here? Is anyone going to get in trouble? No. I, I, OK. I don't, I, don't, I don't see that. 
Um, I see, I, I, I'm, I guess I'm trying to, I feel like I keep saying the same thing, but I think that if, <laughs> I just I keep reading back the to same it. thing. <laughs> if I understand the question, and I, I, I may not understand the question. Okay. We may come back to that. Okay. But I do, I do agree that we probably need to move on. That's okay. You yeah, and, and then come back to it. But just think of this when we move on. We're okay. giving an individual, and in this case I believe a female, the right to make that decision. Okay. Fast forward. Guess who made the decision in the example I gave you? And that's okay. The, are you, so the, the physician, you're saying... I made it. He listened to me. He asked me. I see. I see. So, but I don't see in that situation that her right to reproductive autonomy was infringed upon, unless I'm not. Well, here. what if I said go the other way? I see. If she, if, if. She what if I said to... save the baby? Forget about her. Right. So that. Right. So it establishes that that right. But she didn't make it. The woman didn't make it. That's my point. And, and this is probably part of a longer discussion we can continue to have. I just don't want Carl well, to know okay. this thing. But because I, I think it also comes into play what is in place legislatively Nothing. when someone when someone is not competent to make a decision, and um, and your your wife. Not if you don't have an advanced given. directive, that, you know. Well, I mean, so let, so. But, but you as a, I'm sorry. But yes. You as her husband become the agent in that case. I think that is an argument. I don't think you automatically do. Well, let's put this up. The doctor will contact the next of kin first in that kind of situation. And so I think that's something that is important. If it's, a, if it's critical, you, you should review that. But I will say that the medical center did give us some a letter of testimony that's on our on our web page under this bill. And we also heard about the significant um, medical ethics protocols that are in place in specific situations. So that might be, and you probably had that but when we, you were we, we, we have had all of I, that. I, I, yeah. Okay, I'm, one last statement and then I'm done. I wish we had done the bill that we passed over. That was done first. I didn't realize all this stuff was being done over the summer. But we had that bill. We worked on it. We got it. I'd like to see that. That, that does not have any, as far as I'm concerned, any ambiguity. That's why I voted for it, one of the reasons. There is no ambiguity in, ambiguity in that. This there is, in my opinion. Carl. Can you think of any theoretical, compelling state interest that would infringe on this right? Can you think of any theoretical? A compelling interest that would infringe? Yeah, I mean, it says that unless justified by oh, compelling state interest. You mean a, a regulation that would be justified by a compelling state interest? Yeah. I mean, that would prevent this reproductive freedom. Okay. Right, so a regulation that would meet the, the standard of scrutiny right. that's articulated. I mean, that would be up to the court to determine. I'm not, I'm not sure that I could, I could tell you what the court would determine. Okay, let's just, a choice. theoretical thing like, let's say we had something like uh, the Spanish influenza hit the state of Vermont and a population dropped by, by uh, 30% or something like that. And so the state's looking at it their population and saying we got to increase our population. It, it, would that be considered a, a theoretical or a, a, a possible justification for somebody to come to the court? I take it they would have to go to the Supreme Court and make the case that this is a compelling state interest to have more children. I'm not going to conjecture about what the court would do. Um, the court may find to be a compelling state interest. I would just say that it, the article enumerates um, the right to reproductive freedom as a fundamental right. So whether or not the court thinks that uh, that fundamental right could be um, 
could be overruled by um, the state's interest in increasing its population. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be tough for me to say. It, I, I think that it sounds unlikely to me, I'll say that, mm -hmm. for that to be a compelling So, I mean, we can't even think of any compelling interest that oh, I, would, it would infringe on? No, it's not that I, I couldn't think of any. I, okay. I just, um, I, I'm reluctant to tell you what I think that the court would find to be a compelling interest. Other questions right now for Brandon <clears throat> or for the Senator? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, committee, we're going to um, tomorrow, thank I mean, um, one, um, we're going to take up this bill again on Thursday. I forget when. What? 11 a.m. We're going to take up the bill again at 11 a.m. Um, and um, I am still trying to get um, some folks to, to testify. I have asked the ACLU because there seem to be some questions in terms of, um, of that. And um, who, from, who do we contact in terms of um, right to life and then under age 57 when we were there was um, another group I'm sorry I'm not remembering the name that wanted to um, testify uh, I'm, I will testify on behalf of Vermont right to life okay sure. okay yeah okay and is there um, would you be looking for that Thursday um, or another day Assuming that we get off the floor so that there's, that, you know, assuming that we actually can, can go from 11, I think, you know, from, if you, if you are ready um, on that day, that would be fine. If you're not, this is, this is not the last day we are going to be exploring this. And we're going, what I do want to be clear with everybody, as I'm looking at everybody, um, we are having a public hearing. So the people who I think we need to hear from in committee are representatives of Vermont Right to Life and other groups that um, are, you know, ACLU or, um, and then um, I want to look to the um, Attorney General as our state's Attorney General that does those kinds of things for us. Um, but the individuals speaking for themselves as we, we had some of that on age 57 and then we had a public hearing. I think it makes most sense now that if there's an individual who wants to testify, and who wants to have their comments on the record, that they come to the public hearing and submit their um, personal as opposed to organizational um, comments. Um, if they can't come to the um, public hearing to, to um, submit their comments, the way it was identified, I think it's personal comments or testimony at Vermont. Oh, I'm sorry. The What's email the email address for that? Yes. <laughs> testimony at um, ledge. Sorry, at ledge.state.bt.us. But within the subject line. In the subject line, PR say PR5. PR5. Mm -hmm. Okay, because then we'll be able to um, do it that way. Madam Chair? Yeah. Um, I think we ought to have a a justice from the uh, Supreme Court come to. Or maybe the chief administrative judge. Well, I want a judge. You want, I, you want, I want, I want somebody sitting? that can that can talk about compelling state interest and stuff like that. I want I want that mind involved in this. Okay. This is a it's big a, deal. It's absolutely it's a big deal. Um, Might that same concept, I mean, we can, we can always ask, because the, a state Supreme Court justice might need to be sitting and making decisions if someone were to bring a, what's it called? Bring a thing to the court, um, bring a case to, um, to the Supreme Court they may not be able to testify because they are going to be the tribunal that will, in fact, be where disagreements 
are, or, you know. Um, so let me see, let me do some work in terms of who else can descri describe for us what a compelling state interest well, means. Would be a retired, mm -hmm. I would bring a judge from a different state then. For a retired. I'll tell you, someone that won't be doing it. What's that? Somebody that won't be doing it. They, yeah. I think answering, I would agree with you very much that we clearly need to have much, you know, a more clarity as to what is a compelling state interest. Um, I think, to be perfectly blunt, to ask someone and lay out 15 scenarios um, as to is this a compelling, would this be a compelling state interest, um, I think their answer is going to be the same as Brent's, which is it will be up to the court to decide. Um, based on the facts that are specific to that situation. Um, that is what our court system is all about. It's making fact-based decisions based on the unique um, fact matter of the place. But I do think we all need to understand what is compelling state interest um, and what, um, what that means and if you have the law that came out of this room, and that's what you're working on, none of this, you don't have to worry about any of this stuff. Once you start putting this stuff in, then you have to worry about it. And I, you know, I said that before we even did the bill. You're bringing attention to something that's already there. You already have that right. <coughs> And now we're bringing further attention to it. And it, to me, it, we had a nice bill. We did, and we do. And, it's and now we're saying we've got to have the bill and, and this to do well, it. And, it's different. And, that's, and this opens up stuff to how somebody feels about something. And it brings it to Vermonters. Do Vermonters well, they may do say no. <laughs> and they may. And do then, Vermonters then you have nothing. No, um, the fact that their Vermonters say no, if, if Vermonters were to say no six years from now about this, assuming the Senate passes um, H57 and the governor signs it, that I mean, if, if that is law, whether whatever you know, whether or not whether whether or not people in the state of Vermont decide to enshrine this value in the Constitution will not impact a sitting law. So that law would stay um, until unless another legislature uh, until passed. another until no, right until right. another legislature you know right which I mean, some might argue is the reason for a constitutional amendment right. It, it well, is, then let's it, have this and not the other thing, then. This doesn't set in place um, the, a legal procedure, a legal structure and framework. Um, it's That was the argument to have the law. Right. <laughs> and so, right. <laughs> Which is why we did it. That's what she just said. I just said, yes. And that is why, you know, we needed the law. And there are... Um, there is a law, and then there is the Constitution, which frames what are the, um, on some level, the values and beliefs that will, um, and that, I mean, and it goes to, you know, so this is a way, anyway, this is the part. You know, this whole thing started out with, if Roe v. Wade gets overturned, I think everybody in this room realizes it was an amendment to that original bill that we were talking about that gave us Roe versus Wade. Remember that one? Someone was sitting right in that chair giving it to everybody, and then it got turned down on the floor, too. And I think this will, um, you know, Topper, you, um, and others around the table, um, Carl has some, you know, very clear questions about what does this mean? And you clearly have some questions, but what does this mean? And um, what value does this, um, 
does this do? And these, these, this is why we are looking at it. This is why, um, this is why we are looking at it. And my recollection is we can't change it. We cannot change it. Well, this body is not able to. Right. I mean, and that goes back to, you know, even before that, I was born. No, I understand. <laughs> that goes back to, even like, right. me, you know. Uh, um, or your sister. Well, right. Or my older sister. <laughs> um, I mean, that goes back, you know. Uh, the, the history teacher in me wants to look, <laughs> look and go back to all of those things. But, I mean, no, we, you know, we cannot. Um, and um, actually, I believe, yeah. So, um, but so what? What our role is is to it's say up is, it, okay. is up or down, and up or down. Do we think it's? Do we think bringing um, a potential constitutional amendment to the people, to the Vermonters, to people in the state of Vermont, is a worthy um, step to take? My and, answer. And and do we think that this is it? And this is what. But in the meantime, let's get an understanding of what is really in there so that we can make an informed decision um, that is thoughtful. Um, and that's the work that we do. Um, it sounds, I mean, it sounds to me like the Senate um, dotted all their I's and crossed their T's. Can't Good. believe it. Why don't we no. do this first? Why didn't we do this before we did the law then? Because because this guess is so what? important. Well, I'm, I'm not saying. You know, let's oh, you know, because, damn it, constitutional amendments have to start in the Senate. Well, it was worked on all summer, from what I heard. It, this was coming all the what? time. Why did we waste that time with okay, the other thing? Okay, um, Logan, I'm sorry, I missed your hand. What's up? I thought your hand was up. No. Oh. I, no, I, I was just scratching my eye. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, you fooled me. <laughs> um, okay. I think we've talked enough. I think, okay. <laughs> I think we've talked enough. Um, uh, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow we are going to, um, you know. Thank you, Brent. Thank you very much. Um, do some more around. Um, remember, we had a walkthrough of the act relating to substance misuse prevention, and we had lots of questions. Some of which was, okay, you know, one, let's, why do you want to do it? And um, Commissioner Levine will be on the phone, um, and we wanted, you know, we someone said, oh, it looks like Delinda's position is going to go away, and and the the the, um, the opioid council, and you know, what so we want to hear a little bit from her in terms of that. And then we were curious as to, OK, don't we have this director of prevention and resilience in the agency? And where does, is, doesn't that doing the same thing? So that's the first. So that's actually, you know, the morning is really trying to get a handle on that. And when we get off the floor, um, it, we're going back to um, uh, raising the age of um, when someone can purchase a tobacco product to 21. Um, we've got some people, again, Mark Levine on the phone and the Medical Society. Um, we've gotten a lot of information. We had questions, what do other states do? Um, stuff like that, which we can review in terms of that. Um, and then just as a heads up, on Thursday morning you will see that we again are doing um, an act relating to substance misuse prevention for the first like hour and a half. Um, the congressional delegation asked if they could come, and you know I, I'll say no to like all sorts of people, but I won't. <laughs> but I won't say no to the congressional delegation. So, um, 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 and, and there are other people who are coming. I think someone from another, you know, whatever. They were all once once someone from Leahy's office. Everyone. Well, so then I made sure that everyone else was invited. So we, um, we need to clean our desks. No, yeah. because we're going to be in room 11. Oh, okay. Okay. We're going to be in room 11. Um, so when is this? That's on Thursday. Thursday. So I wanted, I mean, and I want to say that the impetus for this, just to, I mean, besides the fact that they offered, like, oh, fine, of course, whatever you want, Senator staff. But it was in response to their staff had read and knew that this committee and the legislature was interested in um, substance um, misuse prevention and that there was no money. I'm not sure there really is money, but they're going to talk about what the federal government has done, whatever. So that is where that's all come through. And then 
on Thursday we again pick up um, Prop 5. And that that 146 is the one where a bunch of different things right. are... Right, right, right. It really yeah, is to okay. consolidate. It's really to consolidate all of those commissions and advisory councils and groups and um, that deal with various aspects of substance use prevention and tobacco control and prevention and and have sort of put them together. Maybe and put them together. Maybe we could do the same thing for those toxic substances. <laughs> Everybody's got their own advisory committee on that. Yeah. Anyway, so that's sort of on our week. Okay, thank you very much. See you all tomorrow. <laughs>